all right here's ferrara we're gonna have to uh you you be the guy that tells him he we lo he lost his budget okay okay well like when right uh, when he here he comes yeah jason ferrara uh chief marketing officer we thank you for uh joining the uh the board meeting here um you know that 150 pleasure million to be we, pleasure to be invited um you know that 150 million dollars we said that you could spend uh this year uh yep jamie carney has some information yeah i'm an investor here uh you, you just lost 120 million you got 30 million left go go figure it out ah interesting it sounds like 2008 all over again <laughs> <laughs> I, i've been there I wish it was that good <laughs> so 2008 sounds fun at least we knew what the problem was <laughs> So Ferrara, when they give you a budget, you look at it's like, yeah, right. <laughs> how much do I really get to spend? What? Yeah. How does that go I, down? I I would like it to go down where they say, how, what would you like your budget to be? How it usually goes down is here's what you get, and then you have to fit everything in. So I spend a lot of time with, here's what I want, and then I get a number, and then I have to like fit the two together which is which is not a super fun process, uh, process. yeah because yeah. here we are it, it know, works. two two months left in the year and it's like yeah. oh man it's a shit show uh ferrara uh those commercials we, we we let you have them in september right we let you have them in october but no yeah. mas is that how it goes yeah now you right? gotta get up so here's a question for you, Jason. This yeah. year, how many times yeah. have you had to tweak your your uh, go through <laughs> and and clean your number for even this year? Two times? Uh, oh no, probably like four times. Okay, so the, now, some of that some of that's because of me. So some of that's like, where do I want to? I want to reinvest some places, but I don't. I can't go get more money, so I have to figure out where to get it from what I've got but it's probably been four times it's probably been at least twice that our cfo has come to me and said okay sharpen this up figure out this do you really need this i noticed this didn't get spent yet so is it happening or if not uh, boy i could really use that back yeah so that's why he was asking me before you got on finance's role this year i'm like this is one of the worst years to be in finance if you're in finance because you've done it twice by the CFO, yeah. the finance team has probably done just for this year detailed overall reconfigurations of the numbers across the board. Um, they've probably done more. They probably have a hidden one of, you know, the CRO is right. saying we're going to do this. Right. CFO and the finance team goes, they're not going to do that. They're going to do this. We believe yeah. it's going to be much less. They're going to be very conservative and say, well, let's do worst case scenario planning. Um, well, I think. You know, I think that's an important thing for, like, I, when I when I first joined Sassholes, you know, back a couple of years ago, and when when we would talk a lot about if you're young in your career, what's something that you need to know that you might not know? I think that's really important for people to know, which is the finance team has multiple plans. Yeah. And when you get a number, you have to understand what that number is and be smart enough to know that there are multiple numbers. So what you're getting is a little bit different than the number that maybe your boss has, your boss's boss has, the the CEO has. Cause because Jamie, that's totally true. There's there's constant modeling going on. And I don't think that people until you know that, you don't know that, right? You just yeah. kind of go along doing your job. Yeah. And it's really important to know.
Welcome to SaaS Souls. We are revenue ops with an edge. With decades of making interesting decisions, Jamie, Jason, and Pete are dedicated to helping aspiring sales leaders accelerate revenues with our no BS approach to sales leadership strategies and tactics. We got some shout outs to do. Rashida Jamil got a new gig as lead technical recruiter at Parallel Systems. Priyanka Matu, four years at Rainstream Web. Becky Craig, two years at Sweet Analytics. Old curmudgeon himself, Joel Cheeseman, is part of this tag salad with three years at Rectex. Reed Daly's got a new gay client relationship executive at Cone Resnick, LLP. Laura Braun, promoted to senior manager at Datadog. Old school, Ron Heyman, man, how you doing? Two years, Amazon Web Services. Dre Fay, three years at DF Marketing Solutions. Hey, old school Wendell Brenner, three years at Zep Inc. Craig Patterson, six years at Defense Construction Canada. Amy Fitch got a new gig, product manager at Posttrionic and Fennel. Hey, Ratty Tammany, one year at Cartelligent. Brahms Vaughn got a new gig as bankruptcy paralegal at Warren and Migaliccio. Hey, old school, Bill Leonard, one year at Mental Health Technologies, MHT. Congrats, man, you guys are in biz, love it. Dominic Pasta, two years at EXT. Milo Primo, eight years at Advanced Search. Andrew O'Donnell, got a new gig as Director of Services Support at EV Box. And of course, we have some happy birthdays. Zachary Mitchell, Mia Martikinen, Brian Horowitz, Matt Gaines, and Tanya Nolan. Another spin around the globe. Our show is supported by listeners and viewers just like you. We'd like to thank Demand Farm, Winalytics, and Aaron J for their continued support. Demandfarm.com. Unlock key account growth with Demand Farm's large deal, key account, and relationship intelligence products. Go to demandfarm.com now to schedule a demo. Ask for Iron Man. Brent Keltner's Winalytics Revenue Acceleration Playbook Masterclass. In five hours over five weeks, help your sales and go-to-market team build the mindset and skills for a new buyer environment. Kick off in product-driven selling versus authentic conversations for all go-to-market teams. Team-level sessions for self-assessment and team dialogue. All go-to-market team wrap-up to identify top go-to-market strategy adjustments. Go to winalytics.com now. So, Carney, we got two two months left in the year. What's going on from the financial side of things? Like, if you're in the finance world, it's been a tough year um, yeah. because you launched your budget to, let's say, in a calendar year. People have fiscal years ending now. But you launched your budget in probably January, February, and you and you worked probably for a month to get it all into the system so that people can update it. Four or five months in, you probably redid your budget for this year because the economic headwinds turned and turned quickly. So you redid a budget for 2022 that was probably wishful thinking to not lay off as many people as you probably should have. You know, it depends on tough. If you took a very uh, uh, solemn approach on it, hopefully you only had to lay off once. But you've already we've already seen a couple companies laying off multiple times. Since the recession, that means they had wishful thinking that they presented to the board, they missed their numbers, and they had to do it again. So there could be this could be now the fourth time that the finance people are going through. How are they going to finish this year? And then what are the? Uh, how can I sell upstream next year? So in November is typically where you're pitching to the board what you're expecting for the end of this year. And what your expect what your what what your expected growth rates are for next year, if, if any. So basically, you're biting the bullet on 2022, but then hopefully you'll get a lower number for 2023 than you would have originally gotten. If you have job insecurity, you're hoping to sell them on your finish of 2022 with happy ears, and the finance team will know that. And you're pitching a higher number than you probably are going to hit with. Uh, uh, all, right, all right, let's stop there. You're pitching this number. So then 
the CROs pitching this number, the uh, chief sales officers pitching this number. Who's pitching this number? The president? Well, so in October, the CEO is socializing that number with each board member. Right. And then what usually, is what is that socializing? Like on so the side? instead of having all eight board members in one room, and this is the first time they see the number, he's hitting them one by one so that he can get feedback and understanding of if they're in the ballpark or not. Because if you are not in the ballpark and you got all eight or nine, it becomes an absolute shit show of a meeting. Right. Now, hold on. Okay. So these board members. They get paid whatever to show up for well, I'm, you would probably I'm assuming we're talking different public, they get paid. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Non-public companies, usually three or four of them are investors. Yeah. And they carry the big weight. You usually it could even be more than that. Um okay. they, they get seats. Now sometimes they have in smaller VCs, sometimes they have the the latest investor might not even have I might not even have a seat. <laughs> They're the ones that didn't make 10 10x already on their uh, money and they're right, right they don't have any say in what's going on at the board level which sucks for them but um they're so, invested so the, C, so the ceo he's going around hey man i'm gonna miss <laughs> how pissed are you or <laughs> yeah. i'm gonna suck what is the level of suck you will accept <laughs> well and i think with this economy they all know the I, I think with this economy, I think everyone looks at the last two quarters of this year as one quarter, right? Yeah. Like it's not, it's a six month quarter is the way a lot of people are saying it. I'm hearing that a lot. Like it's a six month quarter knowing that we're, you know, we're, I honestly feel like we're um, feeling some rebound effect in the economy already, but we're, but the, my company sells to the go to market side, the rev, the rev orgs. They're all needed. They're all starting to ramp up their engines for growth by the second half of next year, and so therefore they're getting a little bit more relief. So we'll 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 feel the bounce back faster um, than uh, uh, somebody selling into a tech or an IT cost center. We're selling into the revenue cost center. Will but, will, a, will a board member do an end around, like call up the ops guy and say, "Hey man, what's in the funnel?" No, they'll get that. They will 100% get that. And so that, so this is also what happens, right? So there's a couple of things that happen. They're out there shopping this, making sure that there's an appetite for what we're, what we're proposing, right? Like, Hey, we're going to not grow next year. No appetite for that. You got to, you better go back to the drawing board. That happens in October, September, October. Yeah. Um, and maybe we have to grow by 2%. Maybe there's a mandate out there. Okay. Then they go out and try to show them what they think they're going to end the year at. You know, like, hey, our forecast said we're going to do uh, 252 million of new ARR or uh, 500 million of revenue. We're probably going to be at 490. You know, is there an appetite for that close? If not, yeah. you know, start figuring out what what does the non appetite mean? Like, does that mean someone's losing their job? You know, like. Like they, they, the 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 CEO is going to have those conversations unless the CEO is losing their job. So the CEO <laughs> might then be like, okay, um, the CRO is going to come in here and pitch this number in the interim. I'm going to be back channeling and finding a new CRO. Right? Those could be the conversations that are going on at the board level. Like because if the CRO has missed so many years of the VP of sales or whatever it is, right. The, the board is going to say, I don't trust this C, uh, CRO anymore. Right. They don't trust the CEO. Um, it's probably a short conversation like, okay, if that's what you think you're going to do, you know, <laughs> they're back channeling and finding a new CEO. Right. Yeah, so yeah. that conversation occurs. And then so the finance team gets the number and then they have to build out a whole detailed plan. Um that assumes a good finish. Now let's assume that they have happy. And you're looking at it, it's like, no fucking way. No way. Right. <laughs> so they they know that this is going to be a long, painful process because they're going to, they have to build out a whole detailed budget. And then they, they, they need to identify now if they're smart finance, people have done it before. 
they're going to be identifying where are they going to uh, get to the next number that they believe is actually going to be there so that when the company misses by 15 million and they got to go find 5 million of expense, they know where that 5 million of expense is probably hidden um, yeah. like or recommend cutting. And then they got to do it again. So I would imagine budgets for next year, because the other problem is no one knows. No one knows it's going to happen because there's yeah. no stability in the economy. You know, interest rates, I think, are going to go up by three quarters of a point today yeah. Um, yeah. or this week. Um, but no one knows. What, is that going to help curb inflation? Is is unemployment going to skyrocket? It's still under 4%. You know, um, it's going to be crazy. But the other thing that's going on you mentioned is pipeline. Yeah. Right? What what else happens with pipeline? First of all, I'll quarter pipeline. If you don't have any type of automatic way of doing some sort of pipeline hygiene. <laughs> hygiene. Bullshit detector. Yeah, bullshit detector, basically. I'm, I'm trying to be PC. Yeah, and it's assholes. Deals don't. People never close laws, uh, lose a deal. They keep it open. And right now, the executives are probably telling people, don't close lose that yet until I'm done with the <laughs> until I'm done presenting the pipeline to the board as a multiple gauge for what they're gonna do next year. Or hey, let's figure out a way to make this pipeline, which you currently have in a hundred and fifty thousand. You're you know you and I both know that this deal is gonna be we don't have any engagement, we don't have anything going on. It's worth though potentially a, a 1 million, put it in at 1 million, knowing that it's zero. Um, why? Because pipeline out quarter pipeline without a bullshit detector is a vanity measurement that allows the executives yeah. to sell. Right. So, <clears throat> that's a big so thing let's say, you're, so let's say it's not a public company. If you were a smart CR, CRO, you would, cause all these uh, non-public investors, they, are looking at their other investments and comparing what is happening at this current one versus the other one. If you're a smart CRO, would you want to be buddy buddy with the other CROs and the other companies and see how they're doing? And yeah, I don't want I to mean, say I, collusion. Well, you got to remember, especially at these PE firms, um, they've got their port co companies, their portfolio companies, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. They're going after their port co companies and they're yelling at all of them. Why? Because they're putting the pressure on all of them, hoping that one of them, <laughs> one, one or two of them, um, come you know, through to pay off for the other ones. To pay off for the other ones, yeah. So, yeah. Um, and they're actually, I would say, uh, PE companies are going to be, this is their time to shine because um, a lot of the successful big PE firms have their own way of, of capitalizing acquisitions. Right. Yeah. They can get their own money to do that through their own finance institutions. And so they're going to be out there uh, hungry to buy companies now because it's on the low end with a three year investment process of hoping that, hey, if I buy it for, um, you know, 10 times, 10 times revenue, we won't get to the 50 times revenue in the SaaS, but we'll probably get back up to 40, you know, 30 to 40 times revenue in yeah. three years. If I just grab this and and fun, you know uh, fuel it so it stays alive <laughs> for two to three years, I can sell it for thirty times revenue and make a huge profit. But do you think that's a strategy? You think that's what happens behind the scenes? All these CROs from the portfolio companies they kind of get together and say, "Man, I'm going to my meeting. I'm going with two percent. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing?" Um, the smart CROs, yes. <laughs> I mean, um, there are meetings, the port co meetings, you know, they have portfolio company meetings where they, they will sit there and say, um, let's get, uh, you know, let's, let, let's get everyone together from our portfolio company and have them talking about how they can help each other out. Right. Basically buy each other's services. Right. Yeah. Um, so they get to know each other. You know, yeah. there was, um, like, I know at the company I was at before, um, they were mentoring. The, uh, we had a similar investor in the company I was at before with the company I was at two times before. I'm not going to say the name. 
Yeah. And our company that I was at was mentoring my previous company on how yeah. to like run the business. Um, so there's, there's things of that nature, but um, everyone's doing bad. Everyone's under stress. Everyone is feeling it. You know, like if someone says they're not feeling it, um, they're lying to themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Or, or they're so far removed from the business that they don't know and they're going to be blindsided. So, and this will happen in some finance, some, some cost centers, like some areas of finance, they might not realize the company's doing as shitty as it is. Right. Like what area, what, what areas of finance? Um, you know, like pure accountants, like the ones that are just doing debits and no. They're doing the debits and credits and they're like, oh, okay, you know, hey, the expenses are down. Hey, we're yeah. not expensing as much. That's a good thing. Not knowing yeah. that they're not even looking at the revenue and the cash that's bleeding yeah. out the door. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because uh, sometimes they're focused purely on a P&L statement and they don't see it as bad because in their microeconomic view of the company, they think everything's good. Um, they get blindsided by it. Some areas so, in IT for sure and software, yeah. you know, they're just coming in. They're saying, hey, here's our, all the uh, all the requests from product of what I need to do. They don't know what's coming. It's marketing too in some marketing cases. I was going to say marketing because we don't have the marketing guy in yet. This is yeah. like you and I are talking behind the scenes. Uh, <laughs> hey, man, we got no money. We got to cut marketing. How's Jason going to handle it? Uh, yeah, the, is, that decision is made usually by the CEO. Like, there's a lot of companies out there that are like, marketing has a huge budget. You know what I mean? But in a lot of cases, don't marketing spend doesn't, well, marketing doesn't have a lot of buying power. And yeah. that's weird, right? They have a lot of budget, but they don't have a lot of buying power. Why? Because the executives are saying, you need to spend $10 million on this. You need to spend $10 million on this. You need to spend... The, the executives are telling marketing what to do and marketing is fulfilling their desire. So even though they might have a $30 million budget or, uh, you know, 60, a hundred million dollar budget, the executives are saying you need to spend 10 million on commercials and on radio and you need to spend 30 million on TV commercials with, with great outs with what great outs like cancel at any time. Yes, yeah, yes. Out, yeah. out, out, out. Yes. And so it's 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 already <laughs> distributed. And so some companies go in and say, man, this marketing guy has $120 million worth of budget. But the reality is he might only have half a million dollars of uh you know flexible spending that could be gone tomorrow because right. if the economy isn't going well, they they first drop. Uh, November and December spending, right? Usually yeah. it's November and December spending. They drop. They drop Where July the and August. Go? The commercials go in September and October. Why is that in a calendar year? Because that's when people are renewing for next year. They're not renewing over Thanksgiving in December. They're making their decision September and October. So commercials go in September, October, and then they go at you know February, March yeah. um, to say, hey, look, we're spending money on on you guys to drive traffic. They'll kill the spend on April, May, June, July, November, and December. Um, that's where all the money gets. Uh, they want performance and marketing to appear when you're renewing and at the beginning of the contracts, which are usually January, February, March. So from a sales standpoint, let's just imagine COVID didn't happen. Or everybody's bouncing back from COVID. And it's like, oh, let's bring everybody back together for a kickoff and it's always in January, January, February. Like, yeah. Yeah. Which is a lot weird. of them are doing it still like that. Yeah. You know, I think, I think they didn't do it for three years over COVID, you know, some yeah. did it this year. That's still going to be part of, uh, you know, you got to remember when, when, when a layoff occurs, the company sort of takes 60 to 90 days to lick their wounds. Yeah. So that, what does that mean? Even the re even the sellers sort of, say, I need to take a breather here. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, com I, I need to see if I'm going to recommit to this company or not. Um, I need to, I'm stressed out. 
So they go yeah, through yeah. burnout be, and, and, and so then they, and some of them say it's a horrible time to sell and no one knows <laughs> that I'm not doing anything. So uh, why bother? Because no one's going to expect performance. Once again, that's where you need the bullshit detectors yeah. to make sure that your sellers, you know, back in the day, Pete, when you, you and even I was running a little sales team, it was all over the phone. We had the, we had the dialers and we yeah. would be able to count calls. And look at, yep. are they calling a switch box or not? You know, the smart ones out there would know which phone numbers are dead phone numbers, but not call them. Uh, like I had one rep call 83% of the time called the same phone number. That's kind of stupid. <laughs> like, I know you're doing, uh, it's, you it's called Bentley really Community stupid. College 83% of the time. Um, but now they need something to make sure, since it's all what? digital email, they need something yeah. to sort of monitor all of that stuff. You know, in that kickoff stuff, and you need to save money, it's, uh, you, you take your busy, the money that you make in January is the most valuable money of the year, isn't it? Rule 72. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think kickoff is a little bit of a boondoggle, right? Um, what's what's I think a boondoggle? What? What's a boondoggle? A boondoggle is like a... Yeah. a um, Horseshit? Yeah, it's just like get together, <laughs> like... Uh, like um, Half the uh, conferences that you go to are boondoggles. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, I'm going to go to Sherm. You're not going to get any business from it. You're back in the t- You're not getting <laughs> any business from these people that are walking around with crazy hats on and stuff like that. You're going because it's in and Vegas. bags and bags of free stuff. Yeah, but- <laughs> you're going because it's in Vegas. The person that's going there is not the decision maker. You know, but you're going acting like yeah. it's a decision maker, acting like it's such an important thing. No, it isn't. It has nothing to do with it. If it's a boondoggle, then why is it always in January and February? And if you got a shit month, December, because, November. Right, so, that, so the they do it in January because at that time they're long. Hopefully, the only, in my opinion, put it on Zoom if there's nothing to announce. Yeah, you know what I mean. Especially now, yeah. don't fly if you want to fly everyone in. You better be launching something that's going to help sales, right? Help your sellers, meaning like, hey, we've got work. Yeah, it's called a good product. It's called a good product, <laughs> yes. But maybe you're also doing like uh, sales enablement. Maybe instead of saying it's we're bringing people in for a dog and pony show, you know, we're bringing people together so we can get them all in a room and go through not sales. There's a different sales enablement for sales training. It's not, Hey, this is how you find contracts. It's Hey, like you, even when we were at our previous company, you took the sales training aspect and automated it through uh, a chat bot. Sales training is how to sales enablement is why and how, right. how do you get to the why of the company and why are we here? Right. And so if you want to come up with a sales methodology, either challenger sale, you know, I think we have the sales V at, um, uh, um, at process, at, just a process, the process, whatever it is. So you want to go through process training. Why is that? You want to launch new software that's going to help the sellers out, maybe commercials or something like that. That needs to be announced at your, uh, your, your kickoff um, to get people excited. But other than that, if you don't have anything to announce and you're just getting together to get together, do it in July, you know, I and mean, do, it, do it when um, there's not business to be had. Now, the right. one thing is, I would say this is every company out there, January is not a great time to meet with clients because it's customary that everyone has a uh, like a, a, an annual kickoff in January timeframe. So you're not meeting with clients anyways, because so why, why are they doing it? But that's the problem. That's what, the reason why everyone does it now in January. I think is because everyone's doing it in January. Fresh you're, budget. You're you're trying to get commission plans out there to be launched right after uh, sales kickoff. So you 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 don't have commission plans, yeah, and full on capacity quota, all that stuff figured out until probably mid January. Oh please, like second quarter. Some of these companies. Well, some of these companies, yes. And I know we've worked for those companies, but most companies <laughs> are launching their quotas and they're they're getting delivered to the reps as they come back from uh, um, uh, kickoff. Oh, 
it's not only they're not only modeling this year but in a lot of cases unless you're a public company a lot of cases if you're a private company you're constantly tweaking a three to five year investment model because a lot of the investors want either new investments every three years or they want to divest and change their investment every three years so the finance team is trying to guess what this year is going to end and then what the growth rates are for the next two to three years that is a constant this is like i'm if i was still at flexera working on the revenue model there um i'd probably be working continuously working 100 plus hours a week um because you're the amount of demands that are put on you by the investors especially at a pe firm are astronomical and they they know you don't know but they don't care yeah they do not care that you don't know what the end is going to be they just want you to constantly refresh numbers for every scenario out there well then think about a world where you don't have you have got a cfo you don't have a controller you um basically have a cfo and an ap <laughs> team <laughs> like that's what you've got so you don't really have the key components to get you the data and or give you the leeway to spend time doing that right so if you don't have a controller now your cfo is doing all that future analysis plus they're the de facto controller plus they're the ones who are like making sure that the ap team is doing what they're doing plus you know whatever the five other yeah. things are and so it gets it gets really time intensive and complicated and that's part of your 100 hours jamie is like um that sounds i mean so the job you're asking me go ahead that sounds so inefficient. I mean, you got yeah. Dolly Dolly that's out there where you can say, hey, man, I'm looking to make an image of Carney wearing a Kim Jong Young suit and yeah. with a smiley face. And I yeah. want him riding a horse. If you can tell AI to do that, why can't yeah. AI, why can't you say, hey, man, What's the propensity of me hitting this 90% number? What needs to go? Where should I cut it away? Why do I need uh, Carney anymore, Carney? Well, because like that's a good question. You can't do it with AI because in a lot of cases, there's two things that you can... There, 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 there's one thing you can always do to cut costs, right? We're a right-to-work country. It's cut people. Yeah. But the last thing you want to do is cut people. So the first thing you do is you go through and figure out how many people do I need to cut to get to this number? And then you go through every single contract out there and say, what contracts can I cut and what expenses can I cut to save people? And hopefully it becomes, I saved everybody by finding costs. I've gone through that during COVID. I remember I went through and we said, hey, we've got X amount of people we need to cut, right? Yep. And then I worked diligently and I, I honestly, up until the day before we made the cuts, was able to save 40 people because I was able to convince without them knowing that I'm trying to save someone's life or not life, but save someone. I'm sorry. I'm not a hero. Save someone's job. You're a hero, Jamie. You're yeah. a hero to us. I would be you're calling up the marketing team saying, do you really need this? It doesn't look like your usage is very high. Right. Why do you need this? It seems like we're spending too much. And I would just beat them down until they finally say, I feel like you need this money. I go, I do. Okay, we'll, we'll, you, we'll you, get You back. seem very defensive on your answer, Carney, but don't, don't you think that's where things should go? Or like you should be in charge of that AI to take, because everything is a fucking lie and bullshit, okay? <laughs> it should just come straight from, the the numbers funneling in okay what do i need to do versus all this subjective stuff don't don't you think that's where it's headed or no mm. I, it's, go ahead well I, two things two things pete one is i'm wondering i don't know so w what we need to do is find someone to be on this show who knows um i'm wondering if companies feel like their financial data is so uh important and competitive that leaving the modeling to AI alone is super risky where like retargeting uh, advertising to 
prospects is yeah, is less yeah. risky, so it's easy to look for. So maybe that's a case we should find somebody who can speak to that. And then the second thing, Pete, I'll say is I've been in businesses where the board manages just by a spreadsheet um, and does not manage the kind of stuff that Jamie's talking about, where it's like, okay, well, you got human beings involved and those human beings make decisions. And it is really frightening to sit in front of somebody who just has a spreadsheet because their question is, well, why isn't it this way? Yeah. And the the answer is, well, because there are humans involved and humans aren't rational thinkers or actors. And so now you have to take whatever comes out of the AI and then you have to apply this human filter to it and say, well, somebody's going to second guess that and make this decision. And in some cases that works and in some cases that doesn't. That, so basically that's what you, I thought have, of when you said that. Piece. You have equity firms that, there's two, in my view, there's cutters and growers. If you're a cutter, then that makes sense. If you're a grower, okay, there's another way to look at it because the downturn they don't is cut when be they're over. growing. By the way, they're still cutting while they're growing. <laughs> Everybody's cutting. <laughs> Everybody's cutting, even in a good economy. If you're an investor, a, a PE firm is, hey, can we do more with less? And your answer oh. better be yes, or you're they're going to find someone who says yes. But, you know, Jamie, but, the other thing you said I think is interesting is, you know, you come to marketing and you say, hey, can I can I get some money out of here? You're not using this. Your usage isn't up. I mean, that conversation I have all the time in in what well, we were laughing about 2008 and 2009 and we're talking about COVID. The reality is when I was in that role, when I was the CMO of a business during COVID, it w I didn't really argue that. It was like, OK, what are we trying to do? Save employees? Okay. That thing? Yeah. I mean, I don't need it. If if the goal is to save employees, then this spend, I, I don't need. We can figure out how to get rid of it because the the idea the, here is we want to help these, we want to help our employees, right? Because they're the ones who are really growing. The if you are, it, that, that, so I would say you were written into the uh, the overall plan was we needed to re reduce costs, but there's some yeah. director level out there that don't know it's coming and um yes correct correct You're right. those are the ones you have to sort of like challenge them continue to challenge them send emails so it's like they can't cover their ass and say we had a conversation about it no you follow up with an email saying you have chosen not to move this the the one thing yes. answering your question though pete the big thing here is on ai and software we're talking about finances okay playoffs we're talking about playoffs we're talking about finances it's fucking numbers. InfoSec, InfoSec, you will never, privacy and InfoSec will never allow someone to touch their finance uh, software. So the only stuff you can really do from a financial situation is on Shit, prem software. Well, you said situation. I love that. Situation. Yeah, that is good. That is good. But the, the yeah, shit situation is on prem software <laughs> is the only thing that will probably be allowed in most of these institutions because. No one wants that any of that financial data to leave its environment and they need to protect that financial data. So therefore, that's why okay. humans are in there. And the other thing is it's not a, it's not until you are living in it, it's it's much more complex than you think. Um, All right, we got the marketing guy here. The last man standing in marketing is Google, is it not? Uh, yeah, I, I guess, um, no one's going to say, stop your activity with Google, right? It, they're all going to say, do you really need the ABM software? Do you really need the, the ad server that is driving lots of traffic, but not a ton of conversions? Do you really need, right? So you're, you're probably yeah. right. That's, that'd be the last, that'd be the last man standing if. If if uh, if the shit hits the fan, that's probably the last place you cut. Yeah. And then the keywords are they you know the numbers going down or up? It, it's a shit time. So does that mean you pay more for the keywords? It depends on the keywords. I get it, but yeah, and it depends on the on the on the competition too. Like you know what's happening with your competition. So so we've got a competitor right now that looks to be cutting a lot of people so we've tried to like well what are they doing in google where where are they making moves there because if they're if they're if they're if they're cutting expenses perhaps there's there's an echo we can hear 
in Google. So I, yeah. you know, it, it really is like, well, what, what do you want your cost per whatever med- metric that is? So if it's cost per opportunity, for example, or cost per uh, sales qualified lead, then you just have to watch that very closely. And what are you willing to pay? There's a range. So you're willing to go up a little bit more. You know, right now I'm willing to go up a little bit more because I've got to feed a sales team that's like, holy shit, it's November. I mean, in our business too, where everybody's gearing up for Black Friday, not yeah. a lot of people are buying in November. Right. So you're like, who yeah, do yeah. I sell to? So that there's there's, you know, a little bit of range there that you can work with. What are the key KPIs out there? Is it all, you know, hush hush or like what's the most important number? Uh close one opportunities. <laughs> like <laughs> nothing's more important than that. So <laughs> so there I, is know, one thing more important than that, cash. Well, yeah, right. well, true. Cash and then close one opportunities. <laughs> exactly. And receivables. <laughs> Those are the three. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, the marketing I mean, is... guy, you're looking at it like, where, if you got to cut shit, you're like, all right, well, I'm I'm going to keep Google. I might yeah. rejigger the words, but, uh, you know, what, what are the numbers we're looking at to d- defend a budget? Yeah. I mean, I, I look at pr- pretty much, I start looking at just demand generation only. And, um, the the demand generation funnel. So everything from like just gross number of leads that are coming in to that conversion all the way through the funnel to opportunities, um, and and trying to keep that within what what you know, the best practice range is. And so, like part of my comp is how many how many marketing qualified leads are becoming opportunities like it's a very tactical thing but it really can tell you what's going to happen you know whatever four or five weeks from now in our business six weeks from now um and and i look at that i mean i look at the funnel and we try to look at what's what's happening there i'm sure there are other ways to do that but that's really what you know i, I, I so stop those, measuring PR those and f stuff. and yeah. sales people better be putting in the right numbers in the sales force 100 percent Hundred percent, and that's and that's why you know that's that's why I'm I'm there with every weekly sales meeting, and that's why we talk about what's going right, and what's not going right. Um, when you when you find a lead that was driven by a webinar, what happened to that? Right when we when we get a lead that was driven by a Google ad, what happened to that? I mean, I was just doing that this morning, right? Yeah. What these conversions did any of them close? And then I go back to the sales team and say, tell me the story behind this thing um and so it's constant connection it's constant connection the part there that drives me nuts on what you just said jason is tell me mm-hmm. the story Story time drives me nuts it's like show me yeah. the data. you know what i mean like yeah, yeah. there's got to be a way that you can look at the data and not not self-reported data you know these the, the the way salesforce was and pete you're like oh how dare he say this but i'm sorry the way sales reps worked in the past, which we can revo- we can remove today, is it would be like a basketball game. You're going into a basketball game. Imagine I'm watching the Bulls Pelicans play each other. Who would want to watch that? But I am. And no one's got a score. At halftime, the players all go in at halftime and they get a hand a sheet of paper and say, write down your stats. They write down their own stats. Yeah. And then it gets aggregated on the board. I bet you the score at halftime would be 146 to uh 182. And everyone's got a triple double because they're self-reporting their own stats. We got to yeah, get out of story I, time and get into hardcore data to say here's you where are story time. It. Here's where story time matters is I use it for because I can see where the lead can I can see all that data, right? I can see what's a closed one and what's <laughs> a closed lost. Where I use story time is Tell me about your, and I can listen to gong calls, you know, tell me about your conversation with this, with this buyer. Were they the right person? Oh, wait, did you know that the attorney was going to take six weeks to sign this deal? What did you do when you found out that? Like, I use it for, to add to that, to that data. I don't use it for, I don't use it for um, board reporting. Hell no. You know, I, I, I no, I know that, that. There's, a, there's a lot of companies out there that, uh, use story time for all their, and now they look at the pipeline in aggregate, knowing that probably 50% of that pipeline is vanity. And then they use story time to back it up. 
There's no yeah. it, Wait, it is, should be is data any bullshit. Yeah. Okay. Um, they they don't look at the data and then use the story time as a way to add color to the data. Instead, yeah, yeah. story time drives the the output. And that's right. where that's where it becomes a problem because then that's it's just story time, story time, story time. They never hit their number. I mean, the reality is here's some stats. Six uh two thirds of enterprise selling companies, two thirds of those, two thirds of the prospects that are named accounts have uh the companies that I see have not had any meetings in 12 months with. That means two. Th- so if you have a uh, if you have a rep that has thirty accounts, twenty of them they've not even touched. Yeah, twenty are just collecting dust for them to maybe future earn. In today's economy, you need to figure out a way to to attack those twenty because the rep is bogged down, and even more so now they might be working five deals. Those deals are taking longer and longer to get yeah. through because of procurement, yeah. infosec, and all of that. And then they've got five that they might be prospecting in. There are 20 that are just collecting dust. Okay. And if those 20 are great accounts, you need to figure out a way to go attack those now so that you can increase your productivity uh, um, as soon as possible. Because they might be great also, accounts, they just don't have time on. And that's and that's where I would go talk to a specific rep too. So, hey, Pete, you've got 30 named accounts. You've got 20 that you haven't touched in X period of time. Why haven't you touched them? what 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 is your plan for that um who wait a marketing many... guy talking to a sales guy or you're oh pushing for sure at the sales 100%. vp okay all right well no i would i would well i wouldn't do that without talking to the sales vp and okay. i would probably go into that conversation <laughs> with the sales vp but those are the conversations that you have and then you can hear like what's in that rep's mind so i know they're overwhelmed and they need help they think that those 20 are <laughs> shitty they like, you know, you go through that and then you say, okay, now I can work with the sales VP to say, what's the plan? How do we build a plan to help this rep get into those other 20? Are there opportunities? Now, Should we forget about a couple of those? Like, that's how I use some of that anecdotal. Now, now uh, keep everything in the context. We got two months left in the year. Shit's sitting in yeah, the fan. Yeah. We need fucking money now. We need revenue now. Yeah. The sales cycle, if we're lucky, six weeks. So, okay, good luck getting something in before Christmas. Like what's yeah. going down from the marketing standpoint? It's like I I need Jason. We need we need an influx of leads now. What do you what do you do? Turn yeah. on the Google spigot or what? What do you do? Yeah. So there are two things. You can turn on the Google spigot, but what you got to be careful of is driving a bunch of. Um, <laughs> you got to be careful of driving your costs way up or your conversions way down because you're just going to turn up the spigot. So yes, I mean, I would try that. I would test that. It happens quickly enough that you can test it. Yeah. But the other thing that, that we're doing, and, and I'm sure lots of other people are doing is I'm looking at segments now that, so the, I'm talking from an e-commerce perspective, right? There are, there are brands that buy leading up to the fourth quarter then they don't buy in the fourth quarter. So they can execute their black Friday and cyber Monday and holiday plans. There are other, industries that buy during the fourth quarter because the holiday time is not a big time for them. You know, lawn and garden is not a big get your, you know, Black Friday stuff in. Even though they participate, that's not a big time. So I I begin to segment more aggressively during Q4 and say, okay, let me build segmentation of companies and, and campaigns of companies that will buy during Q4 and begin to move on that very quickly. Um, people get nervous about that because they're like, well, it's not quite set up right. I'm like, we have all the content we need. Just start, just start. Let's go, let's start and learn. So it's segmenting people who will buy in Q4. And then a lot of that I'm using as learning for Q1, where then I start going back to the segments that buy before Q4. So I, I'm trying to do two things. I'm trying to drive in Q4, but I'm also trying to learn for Q1 because that's those those companies that are prospects in Q1, that's where all the money comes from, those people who are gearing up for Black Friday. And, and, and shit, that starts early. Like if you're gearing up for Black Friday and you're not talking to people about that sale time in Q2, you're screwed. You're just, you'll never get you'll never get traction with them. And and to finish up things, uh let's talk kickoffs. Why are they always in January? But how how do kickoffs help marketing? They, what the, the most valuable money you can have is in January, and we take everybody off the floor in January, but everybody does it. So, yeah, how does kickoffs help marketing? If you got nothing to really 
nothing new going on for our yeah. uh first i'm a big believer in kickoffs help because they get everybody together physically in the same place there is nothing better than your whole company in the same place at the same time doing something that is the same thing tremendously powerful to energize everybody i have always used kickoffs to say this is where we're going this year and this is how you should talk about what we're doing somehow if i were to do that in this kind of forum on zoom nobody's listening right they're in a ballroom they're in a conference room mm -hmm. they're in a however many people you got they're going to hear it one place one time um, that's really beneficial for me i need you know two and a half hours of a kickoff to really do that plus then all the other time that you spend bullshitting with people i mean i, I think there's tremendous value in that it's incredibly expensive <laughs> but <laughs> i think there's tremendous value in that and that's and that's where like working with jamie for example is is important to say like you don't just design a kickoff in january for january you're designing a kickoff the previous year for january to say okay jamie we gotta we gotta afford this event how do we begin to do that because it it has to go it goes in your it goes in your plan right um why do we do them in january you know i think that the baby new, new year new of, you it's yeah, it exactly. sounds like it's all that it shit. sounds like it's a it's a retention tool it's a recruiting you know yeah, hr I mean, should I, be I, loving it right at, at outmatch we did it two times a year so we we did a january meeting but we also did a mid-year meeting and the mid-year meeting i i kind of thought was better in terms of people felt a little freer because success had happened mid-year and now they're looking for the second half of the year whereas in january everybody's pretty tight like like to your point pete i should be on yeah. the phones i'm sitting in this room so right. the mid-year kickoff i thought was was really enjoyable a little looser better team building um and it again, gives you some control cheap. to to move the needle for the rest of the year yeah you can look back and say here's where we here's where we've been here's where we have to go now let's your content is a little bit more driven by what's left so let's yeah. go get that that, so that, either that way is good. Cool. I, I think it's tremendously valuable to have everybody in the same place. I would prefer it be mid-year, personally, because I think then you're getting together and, and a lot of the reps are going to know if they're hitting plan or struggling, you know what I mean, like to hit plan. Yeah. And they're going in with a different mindset rather than uh, what's the uh, – uh, Hey, what, what's the line you always say? The Latin line you always say at the beginning of every month, Pete? Um, Rasa. Rasa. Marketing Tabla Rasa. Rasa. Oh, Tabla well, no, Rasa. You say, that, it's like... you say that every day. Yeah, but Tabla Rasa. Tabla Rasa occurs at the beginning of the year for annual quotas. But um, I think mid-year, some people can be like raise their hand and say, I'm doing everything you're asking me and it's not working. What am I doing wrong? And you can you can almost have like, SWAT teams of hey, yeah. let's bring that group over here. Here's a team that's going to crush it. Let's make sure they continue to crush it and they 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 continue to produce and and come up with better strategies rather than the beginning of the year where it's a little bit of rah rah and uh, expensive. I think mid year you take people off, take them to a baseball game, do something like that. That's more. It's almost more, like a, if you if you if boards are too squeamish of doing quarterly numbers even though they have to report to wall street quarterly, you know, maybe you have a six month number and say, all right, we missed the first half. Okay. We're resetting. Of course the reps will try to game it to make more money in the second half, whatever, as long as you hit your number, but maybe it makes sense for that. I, I don't know. I think with well, private companies, some of it depends on sales cycle, but go ahead. James. Yeah. I think private companies right now, they looked at this second half of the year as a, as a six month quarter. Like I don't yeah. think, I don't think people are gauging what's going to happen by how they ended in either September or October, depending on your quarter end. I think they're gauging how you're going to finish the year, knowing that a lot of deals were the last two quarters have been the uh, the precipice of this recession. I don't care if you say we're not in it, we're in it. Knowing that the next couple quarters, depending on who you're selling to, uh, if you're selling to the go-to-market space, these next couple quarters, you're going to start seeing growth again. If you're selling to cost centers, it's probably a, still another 
six months of recession. Um, well, and, so and shit, Pete, that's go ahead. You, you, you asked what I, you know, kind of numbers and focus and right now, I mean, I, I, this morning just spent an hour and a half talking about 2023. Right. So the other thing I'm doing is like, yes, we're, we're running stuff and we're trying to help reps turn, you know, prospects into deals in November and December. But, um, it is like, what's our plan for 2023 and how, how, what's working right now and how do we grow that? And then what's the next thing that we're going to really build for the, for the coming year. And that, I mean, that's, that's the rest of my week is spent doing that really. And then to c c close up, what about, uh, do we let people go on vacation? What about the finance team? They don't get vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm honest, like, ever. Even if, even if they take days off, they're working. Ever. I know, um, <laughs> guys, finan the finance team, especially in this economy, is your hardest working area yeah. in the company. And they're the most stressed out and overworked. And they don't have time to take vacation because... It's not like something's going to do their job when they're out. So when they're out, it just yeah. means it won't ever ha it won't happen. <laughs> the other thing that's protected this is, is mark this day. Mark this mark day. This day I will yes, tell Jamie you. Jamie says no. It will never happen. You can offshore it, maybe some of the stuff. You're going to offshore AI. The it's it's going to be happen. a little computer robots. box of glasses Jamie. like this. Yeah, robots. Ro totally you got to remember there's. Less accountants than there were a decade ago because they turned it into a five-year degree. Yeah. So when I was graduating with an accounting degree, it was four years. Now it's a five-year degree. Granted, some people might want to stay in college for five years, but not accountants. I did. I would have loved to stay in for five years. So there's less accountants. accountants just bullshit detectors? Like, that shouldn't go there. Account shouldn't there's go accountants there. and there's finance. A lot of the finance team are made up of accountants that actually have uh, a more strategic thinking. And then there's accountants that are looking deb debits and credits. They're the police. The yeah. finance team are the more like strategic advanced accountants that understand what Jason is saying. What does that mean from an accounting perspective two, three years out? And I'm sure I just pissed off all my finance friends out there. And I was saying, hey, we're all replaceable. Relax. Yeah. Yeah, and it, worst, oh, yeah. worst worst case scenario, start a podcast. Yeah, right, exactly. But you know, I think the thing is that with the with the AI angle of this, and and in you know, in all seriousness, what what gets replaced in the future is the mechanics of building that budget and building the models and things like that. What doesn't get replaced in the future is the stuff that Jamie's talking about, which is. I have this strategic vision for a business. Let me plug in my strategic vision and model it out into the into the piece of software. So like the the quote unquote AI or the robots will will do all the heavy lifting and data analysis and modeling, but there's still going to be somebody like Jamie to look at that and say, okay, well, the vision is this. We got to get this out of here. How do we get it out of here in the best way? This this piece of software, this model will help us build that. But there's, but I think that the the payment and all that stuff, all that all that stuff, will get. You got to remember also, you could software. you could be selling your your you could be selling your software and say, guys, it's gonna. I can show you without a shadow of a doubt that over three years, this is going to save you two million dollars. The company, the company could say, that's great. I totally agree with everything you just said. And normally, I would buy that, but one, I don't want to uh, release the cash. That's coming from the finance people. I don't want to do the cash investment now getting $2 million three years from now. That does me no good. Or they could say, I actually, you're, what you sent me is great. For this amount of money, I can save myself $2 million over three years, but I can do something else for $10 million savings. The finance team is going to go through and prioritize all those ROI models and then say to Jason, Jason, I get that that's $2 million, but this is $10 million. You can only buy one. Which one are you going to buy? So that's Marty, what's going I don't on mean I don't mean to piss on your Wheaties, but if you can take so, something as subjective as graphic arts and make a picture, I think you can fiddle around with a, a budget and a plan. That's all I'm saying. I, I and by the way, I'm not in finance. I was in oh, finance. Oh, but I will you, tell you, you there's sales. no way because sales? of the price. No there's no way that it'll happen no because of the uh the privacy requirements needed 
on the financial statements. I, if there's any data leakage of a financial statement out there, you know, the SEC, the SEC goes after public companies when um, somebody gets insider trading information. Same thing's going to happen with uh, private companies. They don't want any of their numbers to be out there. I guarantee this is all getting modeled at Oracle and IBM and Microsoft, and they're all trying to figure out how to do this, and they're all scared shitless of what Jamie just said, and they're all trying to figure it out, and when they do, you know, Larry Ellison will buy another island, right? Because it's going to be the next huge thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, it all comes down to politics and legislation, which uh, a week from today, we have uh, the elections. Uh, Are the finance guys modeling any of that stuff in? It's already done. Depends on, you know, no one can trust the media right now. So is it a red wave or not? I mean, I think I think they would model it. I I know in my previous life, um, I know in my previous life, we would have uh, predictions from the PE firms on what the new governmental policies will be. And then you would model any of that, if that impacted you, you would model that out. If they said it was 80% predicted that this was going to happen, they want you to model that out. Um, but let's be honest, governments, uh, government policies are a lagging indicator of the economy. When they do something today, it doesn't impact the economy for two years. I think it was called the black shoal method, where you look at the uh, futures on the options market to, to kind of get an idea of what the future looks like. Sort of like, you know, Vegas, but uh, for the stock markets, yeah. you know, is the spy going to go up, down? What's the what do the futures markets look at? Yeah. So, so we'll see, gentlemen. Great show. Yeah, good stuff, Pete. Not bad. Good stuff, Jamie. Not bad. We'll I think we use some of the stuff. All right, guys. We Have fun. uh, thanks for uh stopping by all, and uh, hopefully AI doesn't replace any of you all. But we'll always have sassholes. We'll always have the sassholes. <laughs> Always. All right, I'll see See you guys. Our show is supported by listeners and viewers just like you. We'd like to thank Demand Farm, Winolytics, and Aaron J for their continued support. Demandfarm.com. Unlock key account growth with Demand Farm's large deal, key accounts, and relationship intelligence products. Go to Demandfarm.com now to schedule a demo. Ask for Iron Man. Brent Keltner's Winolytics Revenue Acceleration Playbook Masterclass. In five hours over five weeks, help your sales and go-to-market team build the mindset and skills for a new buyer environment. Kick off in product-driven selling versus authentic conversations for all go-to-market teams. Team-level sessions for self-assessment and team dialogue. All go-to-market team wrap-up to identify top go-to-market strategy adjustments. Go to winalytics.com now.